Okay, we are about ready to go with this uh, webcast and what we're going to be talking about today. And welcome to all of you that have uh, taken the time out of your schedules. And it's sort of a weird time right now, isn't it? We're both busy and we're not busy all at the same time. But uh, we do appreciate you taking time out of your schedules to uh, come and attend this session today. Uh, with me is Dr. Hugh Herve. Uh, Hugh is a, um, a registered psychologist, a clinical psychologist with a subspecialty in uh, forensic psychology. And, and welcome, Hugh. Thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, having me. And, and first of all, you've got the Northern Lights in the background. You were recently up north and you got to witness this firsthand. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience. I was in Rankin Inlet doing some training and uh, this was on my bucket list. And so we were able to go out at uh, minus 50 degrees, <laughs> bundled up and uh, see the Northern Lights. Pretty cool. Was, was it what you expected? And more. Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Now, you, you and I first met uh, about, uh, I'm going to say, six, seven years ago uh, when uh, working for a, a mutual client. Um, maybe you could just tell me a little bit about the work that, that you do. It is clinical psychology, but you've got this subspecialty in forensic psychology. So maybe you could just quickly tell us uh, what the differences uh, between those two types of disciplines are. Yeah, I mean, basically, a, a specialty in forensic psychology means that I apply my trade of psychology in uh, the legal context. So I work in criminal justice and civil uh, legal context. And so that's that's the specialty. That's all of my work focuses on that. Um, right. And over the years, um, it's been in the area of working with offenders, working with victims, um, and, uh, and specializing in conducting assessments and investigations. And now an important part of this is, is for example, dangerous offenders assessments, um, also doing threat assessment as well. Uh, correct, yeah. Uh, I haven't done a threat assessment in a while. I've been focusing more now on uh, investigative uh, interviewing, conducting investigations of criminal uh, behavior, and uh, doing risk assessment with the dangerous offenders and so on. Right. Now, this is, this is what we're here to talk about today, and, and that investigative process. Um, Sun Tzu said in The Art of War, know yourself and know your enemy, a thousand battles to be won. Now, how we see things, um, Sir John Lubbock uh, once said that uh, what we see depends mainly on what we're looking for. And what uh, Lubbock also said is that we see the world not as it is, but we see the world as we are. So what I'm taking from all of this is understanding ourselves is, is critical when it comes to getting to objective truth and whatever kind of investigations we're working on. Yeah, I understand. I mean, it, it's, it's a process of knowledge and insight as well as uh, for critical thinking, as well as thinking uh, in, you know, in an evidence-based, uh, evidence-driven or data-driven manner as opposed to intuition or hunches and so on. Um, right. And when you say, uh, you know, know thyself, I think one of the errors that often happens in, in this work is called the me theory, uh, where we interpret other people's behavior through our lens. Uh, and uh, we are not other people. We are our own person. Uh, and we are all such different creatures <laughs> that it's really important to take a step back and, and avoid the me theory. Now, with this, and, and I think it's also uh, referred to as actor-observer symmetry, I mean, doesn't this kind of play out, say, on a daily basis, that you're driving your vehicle, or, or maybe I should even step back, that we judge others by their actions and we judge ourselves by our intentions? So, for example, uh, you're driving along in a vehicle, and let's face it, we all make mistakes when we're driving. None of us are perfect. Um, yet, we're driving along, someone does something, cuts us off maybe, and we think of them as a pinhead immediately. We're judging them based on their actions. And yet ourselves, when we make a mistake and someone haunts at us, it's, oh, sorry, you know, I'm, I'm really a good driver. I just had that moment lapse in momentary lapse in judgment. Would you say that that kind of encompasses that? Uh, that's part of it. That's one of the biases that uh, uh, we're prone to called the uh, fundamental attribution error, where uh, when we make mistakes, where else we'll uh, uh, attribute those mistakes to the context. We'll, we'll give us our, ourselves a break and not say, I'm, uh, it's not my personality, it's just the situation. But when we interpret other people's behavior, we tend to blame them, their personality, that this is how they are. We don't think as much about the context. Um, and it's a common bias um, in, uh, in humans. Right. Now, now, maybe tell me a little bit about that. I mean, what is a bias? There are loads of biases. There's a few that, that directly affect us as investigators. Um, what are biases? Why are they there? Where do they come from? 
Um, you can think about biases. First of all, we're all biased, so uh, we should just get over that <laughs> and uh, admit the fact that the brain is inherently uh, a biased system. And the reason for that is biases uh, reflect mental shortcuts and it uh, makes it easier to navigate the world day to day if you don't have to think very hard. Okay? And so uh, when you think about critical thinking, it actually requires a lot of mental effort and takes a lot of resources out of the, out of the system. Uh, that's why we get really tired after a day of critical thinking, uh, but we're not tired after a day at the beach where we're just <laughs> letting the biases, <laughs> uh, the shortcuts kind of take effect. Um, and so, uh, because they're, they're uh, quick shortcuts, they also occur at a uh, unconscious level. We're not aware of it. And so one of the errors that uh, people do is they think that just saying that I'm biased or I have some bias, I understand I could be biased, is enough to stop the biases. But it's not because those things occur out of awareness. So we actually have to take concrete steps to... Um, fight those biases and engage in critical thinking. Right. So as we say, thinking is hard work. Uh, to, to quote Henry Ford, thinking is hard work, which is why a lot of people don't do it. Um, I find it interesting myself as an educator, uh, speaking to a classroom of uh, investigators primarily, what people would prefer to get is a bullet point listing of how to conduct an investigation, as opposed to being constantly challenged with, you know, you've got to figure this out. Every situation is going to be different. And here's a bunch of things to think about. And you can almost see the look of fatigue coming over people's faces after about an hour and a half of, of these kinds of challenges. So when it comes to this now, you, you say that just saying you're biased is not really good enough. What, what are some of the things we can do to figure out our own biases? Um, well, one of which you brought up earlier, which is um, know thyself. So um, if you're driven by lack of a, awareness or knowledge about a particular type of person or group of people, get to know those people because that usually reduces the stereotypes. Um, if you're working in, uh, so I do investigations, for example, and I train in uh, investigating uh, sexual offenses, and there's a lot of myths out there. And so you have to understand those myths and uh, be aware that they're going to influence us or they're going to influence the people we work with. And then it's to, once you've identified the type of bias that might be relevant in a particular case. So with my groups, what I'll do is I'll sit down with them and I'll get them to think about a case that they're working on and then identify all the potential um, triggers of bias. Uh, so time pressures, risk aversion, things like that. And then um, sit down and, tell, and get them to brainstorm on, okay, now that you know that these biases might be in play, how do you, what do you, ex how do uh, how do you think they're going to leak in your behavior or affect uh, how you're going to conduct your investigation? Once you've identified the behavior that's linked to the bias, then you're able to put in strategies in place, right? So the strategies might be to uh, point, uh, uh, identify devil's advocate on the team or uh, restrict or compartmentalize the stream of uh, decision making. So whoever's collecting data isn't making decisions on the data so that you're not perpetuating uh, the bias from point A to point B. So there's all these different tools that you can do once you've identified this is the, how my bias is going to affect the case. And, and in, in working with groups as you've just identified, so, so if you are a team leader, for example, identifying um, what everyone is particularly good at within that group. How does groupthink start to play in this? And I mean, groupthink by, by some, something of a classical definition is um, our views become more strongly reinforced when we're in a group of like-minded individuals. Um, also within groupthink as well, uh, whether you're a satisficer or a maximizer, uh, the fact is we, we kind of, of want some harmony in the group as well. Um, you know, tell me a little bit about that and, and how we kind of get around those sorts of issues as well. Yeah, so uh, lots of research on groupthink. Uh, it's, it's hard to stand up against the, the group norm. You want to feel part of that norm. And like you said, there's part of a different people have different personalities that are feel more uh, confident to voice their opinions, some less confident. Uh, also based on hierarchy in terms of where you fall in the group. Are you a new to the group or a supervisor? There are cultural um, influences here uh, in terms of the ability to speak up against uh, senior elders and so on. So there's a lot of factors there. 
Um, and we have to be careful because what we see in the, in the, in the literature on bias is this cascading effect where once a bias starts, it can cascade and affect every other part of your investigation. So if you have group think going on, it's affecting your investigation and all the players and then it gets bigger and bigger over time. So it's really important to try to think about um, taking a step back and identifying, let's say one example is the devil's advocate is they'll point to one person and you need to challenge everything that we do or say. Uh, you can uh, identify people whose job is to get information for a hypothesis and the other job of the other people is to get in information against the hypotheses and develop many different theories or hypotheses to test during the investigation. Right. And this can be challenging when we're under, say, time pressures, for example. Um, I mean, some of the, the unique subcultures that I work in, uh, whether it be private or public sector, you know there's a certain mindset and a mentality uh, within these organizations. Um, that, from what I'm hearing from you right now, is bias is something that can be perpetuated, the snowball effect of sorts. Um, so, so that must become a, a significant challenge. And let's face it, thinking is hard work. After a few hours of this, after a while, you just want to throw your hands up and say, whatever, I'll just go with it. Or, or you take that for a mental break and you just think, yeah, okay, well, if everyone thinks that, then that's got to be the way it is. W would you agree or disagree with that? And, and, and uh, again, how do we kind of try to navigate around this? I guess it's a difficult question because every group is different. Now, every group is different. And that's why I was saying, I think earlier, it's important to try to sit down with a team and identify what are recurrent systemic uh, what I'll call biasing agents, uh, things related to the type of investigations you do, the corporate structure, uh, your own um, risk tolerance, um, your own tolerance to particular types of actions. So for example, one of the areas that I work in is child abuse. And uh, that can be a really hard uh, situation for people to cope with. And so then that's going to bias them in a particular way. Right? So if we can think about these biasing agents earlier on, I think we're uh, a step ahead in terms of putting uh, into place things that can mitigate uh, those biases. I don't know if I answered your question there. Yeah, I think, I think pretty well. Um, tell me also a, a little bit about deconstructing the question. I mean, you were all susceptible to psychological priming. Um, somebody comes to you in your role of, of, say, doing a dangerous offenders assessment, let's just hypothetically say it's a defense counsel, I, I want you to, to demonstrate or I want you to assess my client and show that he's innocent. It, is that the sort of thing that actually happens sometimes? And, and how do we get around that, becoming more aware of, of how we can become instantly psychologically primed based on the way a question is asked? Yeah, great question. Um, there's, a, there's a few things to think about here. First of all, there's actually research by uh, Etienne Dror, I think his name is, out of, I believe he's in the UK, who has looked at um, the people who do like DNA analysis or fingerprint analysis. And they found that um, if you give them, prime them with information about the suspect's background, the pre-criminal history, for example, um, they're more likely to uh, screen in uh, DNA or fingerprint analysis that they would not otherwise have screened in in a normal way uh, without that background. And, and in reality, these people, these specialists, don't need that background. So management of information is really important. Do I need to know this to do my job? And if I don't need to know this information, then I should try to not have it. And so one of the recommendations in the, in the literature is to actually, uh, once you start having a referral uh, from somebody, is you need to stop them and say at the beginning, look, if you provide me information that uh, is not crucial to the referral question, uh, I may not be able to continue with this case because I might be biased. Right? And then it's, it's hard to undo bias. And so we want to try to, to, to stop that. I think you and I were talking about a team that... Uh, will be very careful on how they communicate uh, information to uh, other members of the team because uh, they know that this is, can affect that uh, bias. The other thing is separating your roles. Like if you, in, in my work, for example, um, I'm an expert witness and you can work as an expert witness with a team, at which point I need to be very independent from the team. Right? because my role is not to help the person who hired me, but to actually help the court as an expert witness. 
Or there's another job that uh, psychologists can take, which is a trial consultant, at which point you're part of the team. So you'll inherently get biased because now your role is to help that team. And it's important for, to know what role you're serving, to separate those different, uh, to be very clear on your boundaries in any one case so that you don't get biased. Right. We had a, a little bit of, uh, of a robotic talk there as the abbreviator connection just sort of lagged just a little bit. Um, I, this is an important point, and I just want to kind of go back onto that uh, to make reference to what you and I were discussing a little bit uh, earlier on well, is the way that information is conveyed. So one of the agencies that we work with in the United Kingdom are very precise in their language. Uh, for good reason, again, to stop bias and to try to keep uh, the clearest communication going and to keep people's minds as open as possible. And that is, rather than say, be on the lookout uh, for this individual associated to this vehicle, what they will say is, we have intelligence to suggest uh, that this individual be associated to this vehicle. And the way that people receive that information, while it's very subtle, that is really quite important because now they, they're not looking for that vehicle and dismissing everything else. Um, if they're looking for a particular individual, I'm thinking of a surveillance operation here. So, so language, it, it, what you're saying is, is actually very important in the way that we position things uh, with the people that we're working with. Yeah, I think also maybe, uh, just Go ahead. No, no, I think that's crucial uh, to, be, to, to put language down and to be to be clear when you're working in gray areas. So in some cases, uh, if I'm doing uh, an assessment of the credibility of something, um, I'll usually put um, different hypotheses down in the evidence for and against so that the person who has to make a decision on this uh, can see my thought process, where it's a gray area, where I'm more confident, so that they have accurate data, not filtered data, if that makes sense? It, it makes a great deal of sense. Now, Maybe let's uh, think about what this means in terms of, say, a manager working with an investigative team and how they make the request of that investigative team. Like, let's take, for example, financial institutions, enhanced due diligence, know your customer, and we're thinking about anti-money laundering here. Um, how information is presented to a team from what I'm hearing from you right now, it's going to be really important in that same way that you talk about not giving irrelevant too much information to an investigator. Um, I would say that would apply here as well, because how that person receives it, uh, would, would that be correct that perhaps managers need to think more carefully how they ask the question? I think managers need to be uh, careful on, on how they ask questions. I think teams can start educating their clients, who, who, who their managers, who the, who's filtering the question to them, the referral question, to educate them how they want that information to reduce bias. And then I think teams also, which I, we haven't talked about, but one of the other areas that we could, could that would be beneficial is having a very uh, objective uh, evidence-based methodology for doing the investigation, because that also prevents from um, drifting into biased investigative uh, techniques, right? So having kind of a system in place is very useful. Right. Now, one thing we will say here is that uh, if anyone has questions, uh, we usually run about 20 minutes or so uh, in discussion. And then if you have a question, uh, we're happy to field those questions uh, to Dr. Herve as well. So um, if you could just uh, just do the chat, uh, chat to all, um, and then I'll check in on those and we'll, we'll forward that question. And then if you're still here and you have a, a follow-up question to that, uh, you're welcome to ask that follow-up question as well. Um, Hugh, one of the things that, that I hear constantly with, with really experienced investigators um, is intuition. Uh, people talking about my gut is telling me. I mean, what is intuition by definition and, and how can that work for us and how can it work against us as well? So uh, we all have intuition. It's more of a, a, one of these unconscious uh, mechanisms. Um, we don't know how to put words often to our intuition. It's just something tells us that um, this is important or the case is going that way or th this is a person of interest, whatever it is. Um, and, it, and the problem with gut instincts or intuition is there's a vast amount of research showing that experience is not necessarily uh, going to improve our intuition. So you can get increasingly bad with experience or you can get increasingly good with experience. You have to work on that uh, improvement. 
And so you can have a very senior person with a lot of experience saying, I know this, my instincts tells me, but they could be completely wrong. Um, and so you want to, you want to look at your gut. And I, so that's part A. Part B, I think that we should not ever dismiss our gut instincts, but we should categorize it as another hypothesis or theory to test in this case, so that we're not jumping to conclusion based on our uh, gut instinct. We're saying, hey, something's telling me to go down that avenue. I need to go test that avenue. Just test it though. So, uh, and it's it's convenient because someone did ask a question on exactly that topic and I just checked it um, just after I asked the question. So we often say, think about your thinking while you are thinking it. That's kind of a mouthful and kind of a head full to consider. So you're thinking, you're, you're under pressure, you're trying to make decisions, you're trying to draw a conclusion and now you've got to think about your thinking. So be, be questioning yourself on how it is you came to this. What you're saying then is that with intuition, the real danger there um, is, is that can actually, again, once again, have a snowball effect in terms of how we see things. So we go back to, we see the world at, not as it is, but how we see it. Um, so make sure that you're aware that it's, it's gut instinct. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Yeah, because if, it, if your gut instincts leads you in the wrong path and you're still aware that it's your gut instincts, you'll be able to say, okay, well, that, that, that didn't work out. I can reverse cor uh, course and go back down another path. But if you're not aware that you're following your gut instincts, you might follow it to the end. Uh, and uh, by the time you get to the end, it's too late. Uh, so you want to really uh, be aware of what you're doing while you're following it. Um, and again, look at it. That's just another theory to test in the case. Right. And then I guess what, what we, when we enter into, maybe you can tell us a little bit about confirmation bias, because that kind of factors into this gut instinct as well. Our gut tells us something. And then uh, let's say it's in the world of open source intelligence or online research. We now follow a certain path based on what our gut is telling us uh, in terms of that threat assessment, that investigation, that enhanced due diligence. What is confirmation bias and, and how does that affect us? Yeah, so confirmation bias is probably the biggest uh, impediment to a good investigation and, and the most talked about in the literature. Um, and I see it all the time. Uh, so somebody believes that X has happened. So because they believe X has happened, they're going to go and find evidence to support X and they're not going to listen or search for any evidence that goes against X or that suggests Y. And so it ends up creating a fictitious conclusion based on fitting in the data based on what I think has happened. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, in, in my world of, in, of in, uh, investigative interviewing and conducting investigation means that you're not going to follow up leads that go against your main hypothesis. You're going to ask leading questions to people. You're going to badger somebody and keep repeating questions until they tell you what you want uh, to hear and right? all of those things. So we've got to be really careful about that. And we often say, you know, if you want to uh, convince yourself that vaccines cause autism or that the world is flat or, or whatever um, crackpot conspiracy theory you can possibly think about, um, you go out and start searching Google, you're going to end up finding it. Um, yeah. The question just came up. It, it, and how does this affect, say, tunnel vision, for example? Um, if we think about tunnel vision, would that be the same as confirmation bias? Yeah, Thank it's you. the same. In, in this context, it's the same thing in terms of tunnel vision is you start focusing in on one, let's say one suspect, and you believe this person is guilty. So then all of your attention focuses on that and you're not looking at anything around that, any other suspects, any other evidence uh, uh, that nothing happened, <laughs> you know, so many different uh, uh, negative impacts from that. It's usually right. where people get in trouble in court too. <laughs> Okay, um, maybe tell us a little bit more about that. I mean, it's so, so someone has decided that, that somebody is, um, is guilty of something, that's everything that they're now pursuing. They're putting all of their mo uh, mental focus and their attention to that. Um, I, I guess uh, to go quote uh, the founder of the, uh, the NKBD, which was the forerunner of the KGB, a uh, uh, guy by the name of Beria on Stalin's inner circle, he said, show me the man and I'll find you the crime. Um, would that be kind of the same thing here that, uh, you know, this is where we can also get uh, some really bad things happening? Yeah, and um, you can get, this is where you get to false uh, uh, in, uh, convictions, false uh, uh, con uh, confessions, those kinds of things. And um, 
I've even seen case like in, in, in investigative interviewing, for example, I've seen really well conducted interviews in terms of uh, good rapport building, great open ended questions, uh, no leading questions. But because they were so sure about what happened, they never tested the other hypotheses. And then the case goes sideways uh, down the road. So it, it, it can have really like obvious effects and then it can have more subtle uh, effects. Right. So this, this is important here. Um, so when we, when we talk about doing an interview, uh, the way that these questions are being asked, I mean, not just from an evidentiary perspective, but um, again, to be, be thinking about your thinking while you're thinking it, to be testing out hypotheses during the interview process, would you say that's, I mean, that's a lot of juggling to be thinking about while you're doing yeah. an interview? I can tell you the two things that make me most tired are investigative interviews and testifying in court because you're thinking about your thinking all the time there. Um, you need to be really careful on uh, how you say things, uh, why you're saying things, uh, where is this line of questioning going, how's it going to influence the people. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm exhausted after those. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. So, so I, I remember when we were first getting to know each other years ago, I, I, I asked you the question as we were sitting in a coffee shop or something. I said, so are you assessing and analyzing people all the time? And you just said, oh man, forget it. Like I just don't have the energy for it. Um, yeah. So a, a good question has come in here. I mean, you, you're working with people that are exhibiting biases. Um, how do you push back on that? How, how do you deal with that? And, and the specific question is here, when you pair it with a straw man argument and ad hominem attacks, so, so maybe tell us, uh, ad hominem is, is you're making something very personal and you start attacking someone personally. Um, tell us maybe a little bit about the straw man fallacy and, and, and how that all kind of ties into this. Um, so the bias is the problem when you're working with people who are biased is bias is a separate feature that you're working with. You also have to manage people's personalities. And as you all know, there, there might be a few egos uh, in our world, uh, people with strong egos who have a hard time with uh, introspection, uh, thinking about thinking. And so uh, the first thing I would say is trying to develop a team of people who are open to feedback. So one of the things that I, I'm a really strong proponent of is to have regular session of people giving each other feedback so that it becomes part of the culture so that when you get into more sensitive uh, areas or investigations you're able to give that feedback and receive that feedback in a fairly good way um, otherwise one of the hard things to do is to deliver to to tell people that they're thinking wrong when uh, there's time pressures big risk uh, egos involved and uh, more stress we're under, and then you can think about the pandemic right now, um, the more closed our thinking. So critical thinking becomes harder under stress because we now think more about our immediate needs, our ourselves, and we stop thinking about consequences and so on. So one uh, strategy might be to take more of a motivational interviewing um, um, approach in which you're not trying to convince somebody, but you're trying to build insight into uh, somebody's thinking. And so asking them questions, for example, on, um, on you know, would you, can you think about any other uh, things going on, any other hypotheses to test in this case? Uh, and uh, what uh, would happen if this was uh, the wrong uh, way to go? Uh, are we okay with that risk? So trying to build that, that insight. And then reflecting back, uh, you know, if they say no, you can do kind of an amplification of their statement and say, so if we get this wrong, you're not worried at all about the consequences <laughs> of what's going on, right? To, to get them to, to think, to, to jog their, their thought process a little bit. And there's a lot of um, work on this. And if people are interested in, in uh, just kind of Googling this stuff, you can look up for ORS, O-A-R-S, open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. It's a module of, of motivational interviewing that can be really useful for uh, interpersonal dynamics. We're going to go for about another 10 minutes, but you've touched on something there, and that is uh, when we're under stress. Uh, the amygdala <laughs> kicks in, our lizard brain starts to kick in at that point higher reasoning goes out the window. Thinking about world peace while you're, you know, like your, air, your engine is just died in your airplane 
that's not important right now. You're getting into fight or flight mode. Um, maybe tell us a, a little bit more about that. And the example you bring up is a very, very relevant one right now. We're stressed out about a, a pandemic uh, that is getting worse before it's going to get better. And I think that, that with this and people become more stressed, um, again, more tunnel vision. Is this getting into now bounded rationality that there's only so much that we can actually deal with at any given point in time? So we, we may go for the most satisfactory answer, the, the least risky one. I mean, maybe you can expand on that a little bit. Yeah, well, we talked, I think, earlier that uh, uh, biases are mental shortcuts, right? And so we take mental shortcuts uh, because they demand less of us. So if we're already stressed and under uh, whatever the source of the stress, um, and uh, we're not coping with that uh, too effectively, then we're going to be more prone to biased thinking because it's easier. Right? We're, we're already tasked, uh, taxed because of the stress. We're already under our systems working so hard already that uh, the shortcuts make sense. Um, uh, they just require less resources. And so uh, it's, I think, that much more important to really take a step back and have somebody observe the team and uh, point out uh, when things are appear to be tunneled vision or based on some of the other biases. Right. And, and I guess this is where alternative competing hypotheses comes in. I mean, you were talking about devil's advocate. Um, using that test that two people with a similar level of training when it comes to analysis, given the same data set, uh, should be able to come to the same conclusion. Um, we, we have a, another really good question here. How do we recognize when we're starting to chase the evidence? Um, so where does, and, and to, to, to really go with the question here, uh, when does your analysis of OSINT or open source intelligence stop and you start going into conspiracy, uh, into conspiracy theory? Maybe, maybe you can sort of address that a little bit, please. Um, huh. when, so, so when do you recognize? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm thinking it's a good question. Um, uh, I, I think one of the things, and I don't know of any research here, so that's why I'm, I'm pausing. Um, and I think it's a great question. I think one of the things that I always challenge uh, myself and uh, teams is when they're, they get too personally invested when it feels too right when it when there's an emotional you're, you're going more into oh i've got it uh, as opposed to data driven saying hey i've got multiple sources telling me that this is the right path um so i'm confident right so if it becomes more of an emotional reaction i would t i would pivot a pause on it and try to think about my thinking here to see if i'm really using critical thinking or moving into tunnel vision right uh, another question, uh, how do judges address an expert witness's bias? Uh, and also juries as well, because now uh, a judge, we would hope, is more of a critical thinker who's going to be able to get to the nub of the matter quite quickly. And uh, maybe, I mean, maybe you can address that. Do judges identify bias effectively? Juries, I, I, I'm going to suggest, I mean, my gut, so here we are talking about gut instinct now, my gut's going to tell me that juries are going to be very susceptible to bias and manipulation as well. Mm -hmm. So um, the, uh, by, so let, let's put it on the table. Judges are human and therefore all humans are biased. <laughs> the conclusion, judges can be biased as well. Right? And so uh, it just applies to everybody and everybody has to be mindful of this. Um, and, and we saw it seen in, in the cases, for example, on uh, adult sexual assault, uh, uh, decisions being based on myths, right? That's a source of bias. And so uh, everybody is susceptible to bias. Uh, now the question about how to address an expert witness's bias, I think that um, expert witnesses should be really able to describe the, the methodology, um, the set, so the methodology being how, how they came to their conclusion. So what was the data set? Uh, what was the, the, the tests used, if there was tests used. And then from that, uh, is the thinking, uh, the conclusions, logically following from that data set, right? If it's straying from that data set, you need to be careful. And then before, you know, so that's the, 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 the assessment process. And then you wanna see, are they selectively picking data or are they representing and, and open to discussing alternate uh, sources of data? Because the, the, when it comes to human behavior, 
there is no 100% accurate uh, study, right? There, there's always variability as it's studied. And so we should be open to listening to opposite uh, points of view, to discussing them in court, and to always, uh, if we get presented new information and it's relevant, uh, we should be open to changing our opinion based on uh, relevancy. And so it's, it's, that's how I would look at that. And the judges, on, you know, there's research showing that uh, there's not enough attention sometimes paid to this in the courts. Uh, in terms of looking at the scientific foundation of uh, uh, the testimony of psychologists, for example, using the right tools, are they, are they evidence-based, uh, and those kinds of things. And then for juries, um, I'm a Canadian uh, psychologist, so we work very infrequently with juries. Uh, when I go to the States to testify, that's where my experience uh, comes in with juries. And um, so realize that I don't do that as often as I work in Canada. Um, and I find that that whole process is a convincing jury. So it's all about biasing <laughs> people's thinking, right? Um, so it's, it's a different process. So um, we've got about five minutes remaining here. So if anyone has any more questions, please fire them in immediately. Um, and this is an interesting one when we get into juries and judges and the fact we're all biases. I guess my question is, um, artificial intelligence, is this a solution to human biases? If we accept and understand that all humans are flawed, um, how does artificial intelligence start to tie into this? Do we start seeing biases within that too? Uh, so a little bit out of my area of expertise, uh, so I just want people to know that before I say what I'm gonna say. I was talking to uh, an AI coder uh, in the last six months and one of the things that they're looking into that field is that the, the bias comes from the coding, um, right? That there's, some, there's always a, there's, there's a human decision being made at some point, and that's where we have to be careful. Um, and then what the, the, the AI is, the data that they uh, give us, then how do we interpret that? Uh, it's another source of bias. So just being aware uh, of that. Right. So uh, I've heard it called weapons of math destruction, uh, that biases <laughs> are seeded uh, in the initial coding. And then, of course, with the deep learning process, this gets worse and worse and worse. Um, a question here, when being cross-examined by multiple barristers in a homicide investigation, isn't it human nature to defend your hypothesis, even if you recognize that it may be biased? So I guess what we're talking about now is choice supportive bias. You're defending a decision that you've made, even if it's a bad decision. Um, maybe you can address that, that, that human nature. We, we, we tend to uh, get invested in the outcome of these cases. It's a big thing that I talk about in, in our training where um, it, we should be invested in the process of how we do our investigations and admit to the strengths and weaknesses of our investigations because there's no perfect investigation. There are so many factors that are outside of our control uh, when we're doing these things. And so um, if there's been uh, a weakness, we should acknowledge it. And uh, hopefully we've been able to develop an investigation that doesn't rely too heavily on just one piece of data, but that we've supported it uh, in a lot of pieces of data. So if one piece falls out, uh, there's still enough data pointing to the conclusion to, to support that conclusion. Uh, but, and you know, the other part of that question, um, yeah, we, we, once we get invested in the outcome is when we have this, this tendency to become defensive. And I can tell you, uh, 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 a story from my personal experience um, that, that brings a lot of what we've talked about today. I was in a court case in, during a time where my wife was very sick with cancer and uh, we talk about stress, right? And I think I became more defensive on the stand that I've ever been in one of the days and it wasn't effective testimony because uh, irrespective of if I'm right or wrong, the defensiveness doesn't look good in the eyes of the triers of fact. And uh, I had to meditate that night to be able to come back the next day with a, a less defensive attitude, right? Um, and so just being aware of that is really important. And that brings up a really important point here. And that's one of the things I always like about you, Hugh, is um, that sense of humility. 
Uh, it's it, humility is what is really important here when our egos get invested and, and we, we are then going to be loath to change our mind because we feel it's going to make us look bad uh, in front of a jury, uh, in front of other investigators, whatever the case might be. Um, humility is, is, is what is key here. Yeah. Uh, um, maybe a, a couple of, uh, a couple more questions and then we're going to have to leave it and you will talk about how people can get a hold of you as well. Um, what are some pr practical exercises that it's possible to perform uh, in terms of quickly identifying biases? Is, is there anything that you can do as sort of a self-check? Yeah, so what, I think we kind of briefly touched on it earlier. One of the things that I'll do in uh, our courses is to actually get people to uh, think about the different types of biases that are there. And there are many different relevant biases. We've talked about some of them today. And then saying in this particular case, uh, I think these three are relevant that might be at play. Uh, and so how will this leak out in my behavior and really concretely write down the behaviors that you're going to display if you uh, do confirmation bias or if you do the fundamental attribution error that we talked about. Um, and then once you've identified how your, your biases will affect your behavior, then you can put in strategies to stop the behavior but you have to get to a behavioral level. If you just say, oh, I've identified the bias, we, we talked about it earlier, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. And then blind spot bias is where you don't think you have any biases as well. Yeah, the, the research on that is fa fascinating, is we all agree we have biases, but if you give uh, you know, tools to rectify biases, like uh, doctors or, or uh, 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 people who fly, um, is you'll t give them checklists to reduce the errors related to biases. And everybody kind of says, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea, but for him, not for me. <laughs> I'm not biased, but th they need this. <laughs> right, so we're back to that actor observer of symmetry again. So, so just identifying, this is what I'm taking away from all of this, is that we need a deeper level of understanding of ourselves. And this isn't something that's necessarily going to come to us uh, intuitively. Um, we have time for, for one final question here. And then we're going to wrap this up and we're going to talk about how to get a hold of you and some other things we've got coming down the pipe here. Um, have you ever, like from a personal level, have you ever refused um, an assignment that would compromise your objectivity from the start? Uh, yeah, so I talked earlier about being called as an expert witness. And so uh, I'm careful to not, uh, if I'm asked to, to also give consultation on the trial, and I'll just say a stop right there. I can't do that because um, I would then become part of the team, at which point I'm no longer objective expert witness. I am a biased team member. So I'll just put a full stop to it. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you very much to you for uh, taking the time to be here. And if people need to get a hold of you, your website, maybe you could just tell us that. Yeah, so www.theforensicpractice.com. Um, and you can just uh, get my email from there uh, and our contact information. Thank you very much, Dr. Hugh uh, Hervé. Um, I hope that you're going to join us for what we're calling dial sessions, which is the drop in and learn. And next Thursday at 10 o'clock Pacific time, we're going to be here with our associate, Angie Ann. Uh, Angie has a master's in library science from Western Ontario, and she was also a senior compliance officer at uh, TD Bank. So has a lot of experience in the financial uh, services industry. She's also currently the business librarian at uh, York University uh, on sabbatical right now. What a year to choose your sabbatical. But the topic that we're going to be talking about is how to fight this, or how to stop the fight of the COVID-19 or in the COVID-19 epidemic, how do we spot fake news? And as Hugh has just pointed out there, how we kind of get stuck uh, as we're stressed out and we may start reacting to things immediately. So what are some of the things we can do to identify uh, fake news, misinformation, disinformation, and even propaganda. Also on April the 20th and 21st, we are gonna be offering a two-day remote learning course with multiple instructors on critical thinking as well. And uh, if you go to our website at toddington.com, uh, we hope that you'll be able to join us for that. And we're also publishing a newsletter as well, which is free to sign up for. If you go to toddington.com, our website, scroll down to the bottom, and there is a sign up area for our newsletter. And what we're doing is we're writing articles. And we've got a lot of articles on critical thinking, open source intelligence tools and techniques. And we publish these uh, approximately every month or so. Uh, so that's another way of staying in touch with us as well. So again, next week, Angie Ann is gonna be here talking about uh, how we can spot fake news. Uh, the week after that, we've got our associate in the UK, Mark Quasi. Uh, Mark is former police uh, criminal intelligence analyst, uh, former US military intelligence analyst as well and uh, has worked in the industry uh, as far as link analysis goes. And we're gonna be talking about visualization 
of data points and how that can assist us in trying to come to some conclusions as well. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for attending today. And we hope that we will see you next Thursday. And thank you very much again, Hugh, for coming in and helping us out. Thank you.